Hello, everybody. Hello, Mary. Are you sitting down, ready to go? Are you sitting down? I'm ready to go. <laughs> I've got my notes. <laughs> well, I have, I have four o'clock and I think we just go ahead and start the meeting. So we'll call the meeting to order the uh, Water Supply Planning Committee meeting of the Water Management District on April the 5th. Um, three board members are present, uh, Karen Paul, Mary Adams, and I, myself, uh, as well as staff. Um, so um, call to order. I'm going to have to ask if there are any public comments. Are there any, any members of the public known, by the way? And that, I'll start with that. And then, as usual, I'll ask if there's any public who hears this and they get their attention, get up and get my attention, we'll call on, they can comment anytime. So anyway, what can you tell us, Dave? Yeah, we have two. One is uh, Sarah Hardgrave from Mary's office and the other is a member of the public. Okay. Okay, well, then we'll ask, uh, well, I ask specifically. So Joel, let's ask if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to an item not on the agenda. Yes, uh, so at this time, if you wish to make public comment on an item that is not on today's agenda, uh, please push star nine on your phone. And if you're using an electronic device, uh, make sure you push the um, raise hand feature. Chair Riley, uh, we do not have any members of the public who wish to make public comment at this time. Okay, well then we'll proceed to uh, action items. The first is uh, the, uh, well, let's see, the item itself, let's see. I just want to make sure. Mary, I did get the request uh, through Dave from you to move item four up ahead of number two. Uh, we, we will do that. Uh, so that's a slight change in the agenda, just the order of things. Um, so anyway, we'll go to action item number one, adoption of the minutes. Uh, is there any comments or corrections or a motion to approve? And uh, Chair Riley, um, I did submit a revised minute. Uh, on Friday afternoon. So I'm not sure if you had an opportunity uh, to review those. Uh, yes, I did. And I should make that correction to the agenda. Okay. We're considering the um, amended minutes um, that were su submitted later than the agenda packet. That's good. And, that, and the correction was just treating how the, uh, the uh, membership of the committee changed in the first few minutes of the meeting and then who motion, who made the motion yes. to what action? Yes. Isn't that, that is the only correct. change? Yes, that's the only yeah. change. Okay, okay, thank you. So, okay, so the amended minutes with that correction uh, or change, um, any comments or motion to approve? Were the, were the there's a numbering um, error on the first page of the initial draft, was that corrected in the, in the second? Uh, yeah, so on the initial draft, uh, Director Paul, um, I had uh, items two listed twice on the revised uh, minutes that I sent out on Friday afternoon. It's uh, listed one through five. Okay, thank you. Okay. I move we yes. accept the minutes. That's right. Yeah, I need I'll a motion second. to approve. I uh, is there a second? I'll second. It's moved and seconded. Um, let's see, uh, roll call please, Joel. Director Riley. Aye. Director Adams. Aye. Director Paul. Yes. The motion carries and passes on a vote of three to zero. Thank you. Um, we will go to the action items now. The uh, first item we'll consider will be, it's listed as item four, but we'll take it up first. Um, and that item is um, expectations of aquifer storage and recovery. Uh, yeah. Expectations. So Dave. Yeah, I'll, I'll introduce it and then we'll uh, bring John Lear in. Um, <clears throat> throughout the last couple of years, uh, there's been just kind of a, uh, a public undercurrent about the reliability of the 1300 acre foot per year number for aquifer storage and recovery. Uh, mo more recently, that particular uh, average value has been questioned at the Watermaster Technical Advisory Committee. Um, 
I think there's some misperception out there that aquifer storage and recovery will always run within a, a water year rather than build up a, a supply. So previous um, functionality has kind of been accepted as the long-term model, which it's not. And what I mean by that is typically, um, and, and definitely before Pure Water Monterey began delivering, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, State Board uh, all and, and NOAA, uh, National Marine Fishery Service, all had somewhat of an expectation that in most years, any water that was set aside from ASR in the winter would be used in the following summer to offset any summer pumping. Um, this has been uh, departed from a little bit. I mean, I can tell you right now that sitting in the ground is about 1,290 acre feet. Um, so not all the injection has been taken out. Um, and that's because we're building up uh, in, in some cases more water than we can use. This memorandum uh, touches on, but doesn't fully capture some information that John will bring to the water master. Um, but that 1300 acre feet per year number has appeared in testimony a variety of times, going all the way back to the initial application for the uh, Monterey Peninsula Water Supply Project and then re-supported through uh, California American testimony um, at least five times that I can count, um, as well as being in RBF uh, consulting's uh, attachments to testimony and so forth. So that number has been out there for quite some time. John has given you kind of a, its mathematical underpinnings. Um, as you know, not every year is alike uh, climate-wise or rainfall-wise. And so the, the unimpaired stream flow related to the Carmel River um, is going to be great in wet years and uh, less great and you know, not so good in dry years. Um, but if you look at the distribution, a normal distribution of all the years and all the data, then you can kind of hone in on the 50th percentile of operational days, which is what John has done in the second paragraph um, and the third paragraph. So what John's concluded is even with the difficulties in operations um, with the, uh, where we stand today is just under 3000 acre feet at the 50th percent level with a high degree of likelihood that we would exceed 1300 acre feet um, with some of the improvements in the well capacity uh, that are being proposed in the uh, Carmel Valley. Um, so this was just an effort to uh, remind people that that number has basis that's been around a long time. And then later uh, with the graphic towards the end of the staff note, um, this is also speaking to the, the point that I was making earlier that once the cease and desist order is lifted, aquifer storage and recovery is designed to work like a reservoir behind the dam and necessarily build up volume from the normal to wet years so that you can tap that volume in the reservoir in the normal to dry years. And the graphic that you see basically uses uh, historical data that uh, if you have questions on John can give you a little bit more. But even if you randomize the historical data and you know move, separate the years from each other, um, you'll, you'll end up with the same result. And in fact, what it's telling you is that aquifer storage and recovery if left to be run uh, as a water supply project does in fact build up a supply behind the dam, so to speak, it does build up a reservoir. Um, when we get to item two about protective water levels, there is a little bit of a, uh, an added point that I'd like to make, but I'll, I'll save it for that staff note discussion. Um, John Lear, do you have anything you want to add to this? Um, we do not have a PowerPoint. It's basically what's in the staff note is, uh, is all the information you need. No, I, I think you summarized it. Um, great, Dave. Um, and just that the, 
the numbers for the average production per year were the ones that the district also included in the most uh, recent general rate testimony case. So this has also been uh, sent as testimony as well, the, um, the average numbers per uh, water year. So that's the only other thing I'd add and then I'd be ready to answer questions. So I guess- the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mary. You go ahead first, Mr. Chair. Um, What's the question that uh, is being raised by the water master that causes you to want to clarify this? Are you talking to me? No, I'm talking to John, I think, <laughs> or Dave. Are you talking to me? <laughs> I think there's, well, go, going forward at the water master, there was a uh, talk about um, the the protective benefits of, of water levels and protective water levels and how much water that would take. And then there was talk about, um, well, the, we need to compare the different projects, but the different projects will acquire different model input. Uh, and so the, if we do move forward at the water master, analyzing whether or not different projects do or do not reach protective water levels, we would have to clarify where the 1300 acre feet came from. And there was a desire at the last water master uh, meeting to bring forward a clarification for the 1300 acre feet number that was used in the Pure Water Monterey expansion. Okay, okay. And thank you for that, because I know there's been a more recent um, uh, conversation at the water master about the protected well level. And it's, it's been in their um, authority, I guess, to address this. Um, they don't have any funding capacity that I know of, but anyway, it's, been, it's within their jurisdiction to talk about it and plan for it and, uh, and maybe do something about it. But it's only been recently kind of come to the top of the table for discussion, um, even though it's been on their books for a long time. Uh, anyway, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for clarification as well, so I appreciate this input. Uh, Mary, let's go to your questions. Yeah, I have a couple, uh, and I guess I, it's still going back to the, you know, using the full 1300 feet as we were looking at all of the calculations. And I'm, um, I guess I, I think you tried to explain it, but I don't think I was, you know, conscious enough to be able to understand it. But I don't understand how we can, um, count the, use the full 1300, or excuse me, use, yeah, the full 1300 feet from ASR and still be able to build up the supply that we need to do, to do there. That, I, I don't quite understand that. Right, no, that's a, that's a really good, very good question. <clears throat> and if you go to the, um, and I'm not sure how they printed it in your packets, but the graphic at the bottom of the staff note, the, we're gonna ignore the little squiggly green line um, that reflects pure water Monterey uh, going in and out of the aquifer. But the blue volume, uh, the shaded area, each, each stair step up or stair step down represents uh, how much water would have been available to ASR and how much was injected or how much was withdrawn from ASR based on the historical uh, timeline of water years. And so what you see are, you know, three, especially the fourth year significant uh, injection. So in, in wet years like 2017, where 2,345 acre feet were injected into the system, if you had taken 1,300 out that year, if you relied on 1,300, you would have left a piece of it in the ground. Then if you had a subsequent year that's normal to wet, you, same thing would happen. You would be front, front running and, and leaving behind uh, some water in the ground. But then you hit a year like, well, let's just say this year where um, injections to date are only 66 acre feet. Mm. In order to take 1300 acre feet, once you reach kind of a steady state, you're gonna have 1300 acre feet in the ground. Um, where this doesn't work really well is when we continue to operate in a gallons in gallons out uh, operation scheme pre-lifting of the CDO. 
So you could very well be in a year like our year where you put 66 acre feet in in the winter and next July you take 66 acre feet out and you're done. And so if you haven't built up this big blue mass, uh, you know, water stored in the reservoir, you really don't have any, um, uh, any chance to build that up so that on average you can take 1300 acre feet. One of the, the schemes when we've evaluated pure water Monterey expansion is if you, and, and this is in uh, item two staff note, but I'll just jump to it right now. If you start in drought, so you, let's say um, you lift the CDO and your very first years are drought years, then you're not building up this reservoir, this big blue mass of, of water in the ground. But if you had pure water Monterey expansion available and you know that the market absorption of new water is somewhat slow, that first year you've got 2,250 acre feet of potential new supply from the expansion. But based on the AMBAG growth forecast, you're gonna use 37 or 40, let's say. Um, even if there was some pent up demand and you use 50 acre feet your first couple of years. So you're afforded the opportunity of taking that excess capacity from the expansion project and run it for three and a half to four years and put the excess into the ground. And now you'll have a five-year drought supply sitting in reserve in the ground ready to go. Um, that kind of behavior would give you the option to uh, basically start out in a drought and still build up a reservoir. But over time, based on what the weather tells us, is all of these little stair steps up tend to outweigh the stair steps down over this piece of historical record, thereby you would be building up uh, that surplus that you can then draw from in a dry year. And that's how it was intended to work. It's kind of like, a, you know, as I said, the reservoir behind a dam, you don't wanna drain that dam every year. At some point you wanna have four or five, six years worth of supply behind the dam. And that's, that's how ASR is actually designed to run in the long term, uh, is building up that long term supply. So if we, in fact, are entering into a drought and we've only put in 66, yet we're projecting that we're going to need to take out 1300, how many, and let's say 66 becomes the new norm for the next five years. Right how many years will we be able to rely on that 1300 from here? Not, not at all. So that scenario is the start and drought scenario. Now we don't need the 1300 every year, but as we get clo closer to the end of the milestones under the cease and desist order and closer to enforcement of the legal right from the Carmel River, then yes, that operating assumption becomes more important. So, so much time has passed that we're not looking at a new project coming online with surplus. Now, we know we can run the, the plant um, at a little higher flux. And when we get the two new deep wells in before, you know, a year from now, we will be able to produce some additional water at Pure Water Monterey without the expansion um, and, and get it into the ground, which will help. But yeah, it's this interim period between the permanent water supply project, whatever it is, desal or pure water Monterey expansion, and the December 31st, 2021, end of the milestones and end of the effective diversion limit, where these numbers become very precarious. So yes, we've got practically 1,300 acre feet sitting in the ground today, which would, you know, in effect, buy you one year of 1,300 acre feet it's nowhere close to this long-term operation model where you built up, you know, basically if you wanted to have a five-year supply, you'd want 6,500 acre feet sitting in the ground, ready to go. That would be your five-year drought scenario. And we do not have that right now. We've got one year in the ground. And so we would, you know, if, if the passage of time hadn't 
gone on so long trying to get, you know, the, the golden ticket from the Coastal Commission. Um, if, you know, if a project had actually been evolving, then we'd be looking at, you know, something coming online in 2022, but we're not. And so it's really, yeah, the, the next couple of years, we will be uh, very subject to drought concerns because as I said, there's just been no long-term buildup of the supply behind the, the ASR reservoir. Well, that was eye-opening. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I appreciate the, 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 uh, the, the question directed specifically to the, in, um, uh, the injection rate as opposed to what's the saving, what's the current, um, anyway, the numbers, the numbers, I appreciate that. What I had a hard time understanding is the blue mass in the chart and the scale that's on the left, because I, could, I couldn't tie those plateaus to what event happened that would cause those plateaus to increase the way, increase the water behind the dam, right behind the reservoir. I can speak. I can speak to that, Dave, if you'd like me to. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Director Riley, this is um, th this is it's almost um, misleading to have dates on the bottom of this chart because this is a a climate record that was that was created by superimposing the drought of the late. Um, of the 90s to the drought of the late 80s and it's a reordering of the climate and it really should just say year one year two year three so if you look back to um, an event that happened in october 20 you won't find one that would correspond to that much injection is, is that your question well that's part of my question um because first of all i didn't i i i, I understand that you i understand these were yearly tracks tracking some yearly data. What I didn't understand is the vertical access of 5,000, 10,000 acre feet. Those numbers looked really steep, really high to me. And that's kind of, and I was trying to apply this to ASR as well. And I don't, I don't, I don't understand how those numbers apply. Yeah, that, that, that um, is also goes to the um, rate per year. So this would be, this chart would be at the full water rights that um, the district and Calam hold together. So it would be, uh, or currently there are injection facilities that can handle up to 29 acre feet per day. Um, there are, as in the staff note, we're trying to get to with the, um, the infrastructure that's in the most recent general rate case, we're trying to get to rates um, of, of above 1300. Um, the 1300 would require, would require the rate of 13.2, but with the new well and the well field um, that we would be able to harvest probably five and a half to six and a half more acre feet in addition to the 13.2. Um, so it would it would not be um, 29 acre feet a day, but it would be 20 feet, 20, 20 acre feet a day that you could harvest. So that that difference increases the steepness of the lines. However, we have done this analysis with the other. This was the graphic that was in um, the Benito uh, memo, which was associated with the modeling that was done for the um, SCIR, um, but the analysis has been done to look at what it would what it would look at today to rely on a drought reserve that is uh, um, based on something between 15 and 20 acre feet a day. However, that has not been published anywhere. Yeah, and, and keep in mind too that it, it depends on how you prioritize your available supply. Um, you know, if you're in a year where, so let's just take, for example, Callum's legal limit off the major water rights, so not the Table 13 water right, from the Carmel River is going down to 3,376 acre feet. If for whatever reason, they didn't take the full 3,376, well, then that water is not stored anywhere. It's run out to sea 
and um, now you've had to rely perhaps greater on your water and storage from Pure Water Monterey and ASR than you might otherwise have been required to. And so some of this modeling that led to this um, kind of prioritized ASR withdrawals last, but if that wasn't the case, then of course you, you don't build up your reservoir uh, to the same level. Similarly, if your injection rate is lower than anticipated, um, same problem. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is assumptions driven, but conceptually it's, it's the, the same. Well, so, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse, but I want to go back to the pipeline that we were talking about at the last board meeting. So I've just heard the words I don't like to hear, which is the water just runs out to sea. And I'm just wondering if, if that remains an issue. If we had, if we get the, like, if we can move ahead, if we were to have voted to put the pipeline in and we were able to do it quickly and now, would we not be better positioned as far as looking toward, you know, the possibility of drought and being able to capture while we, you know, we can inject and extrude at the same time? Yeah, I think, you know, now we're at the point of what will tomorrow bring or what will next year bring? Um, you know, we're not done yet necessarily. We could have a, you know, a series of April rains, but the issue of uh, running in both directions during the shoulder months doesn't look like it's gonna be an issue this calendar year, but does your staff prefer to have a parallel pipeline to maximize ASR going forward? Yes. I mean, I think we've made that clear. Um, and so if we were in a mode next year where you could be uh, extracting and uh, injecting at the same time, you know, we'd love to have it. But I think this year, apart from, you know, an April surprise, I think we're pretty much past it. But, um, you know, that pipeline is in the SEIR that Monterey One Water is considering, um, or at least the, the portion that we talked about it overlaps with uh, you know, a pipeline in that SEIR. So it may happen, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see, but getting something out of it for this particular season is, un is unlikely. John, is that your read? Uh, yeah, yes, Dave, um, I, I think that's right as far as um, the functionality of the system for um, the rest of this year. Uh, and then when we bring into next water year, when the um, when the full legal rights are the 3376, we run into the stacking of the columns problem that Chris was showing us where we need water moving south at all times to make all of the deliveries. However, the parallel pipeline um, with a thumbnail calculation could get us not an average of 1300, but an average of around 1100. So it, it, would, it wouldn't be the full 1300, but it would be a good component of it that you'd gain with that piece of infrastructure. Okay, can I go back to, um, let's see if I'm on the right page. Um, John, I think you said earlier that the uh, blue chart represented, I, th I think you used the word infrastructure in there somewhere that, um, uh, and uh, Dave, I think you may have mentioned it too. I'm trying to tie together the, the um, at least this blue mass, you know, that that's appears in the chart here, uh, which seems like an awful lot of water to me, but way more than what I was thinking any, any um, um, data would support. Maybe some theory supports it, but I don't know if data supports it at this point. Um, but but my, my question is, if the 50%, am I on the right memo where you were talking about 50% uh, is kind of the statistical uh, category that you're kind of basing things on? Yep. But, and w which means it's not, it's a normal year. I mean, that's what you're trying to compare to yep. normal years? Yes, uh, exactly. Now, is that, is that, does, that, does that still hang true? with the volume of water that's presented in the graph. The graph is the one that's kind of causing me 
you know, conceptual problems. <laughs> and that's why I'm trying to understand what was, what is it that you're trying to tell us in the blue mass? Uh, and I, you said it's in modeling data, but what's it tell us in the real life, you know, the next few years? Right. So, so if you look at what I think is the third, is it the first the summary, second paragraph, then the third paragraph of the staff note, it, no, sorry, the second paragraph of the staff note, it talks about um, for the last four um, water years when we had the infrastructure of the four wells in and the valley wells um, are on a certain maintenance um, cycle and um, we have the Monterey pipeline for um, three of those four years when we look some years um, were better than others we were learning some years um, some of the wells produced more and then sometimes you have some some operational days that um, are down and you're trying to get due to storms in the valley and so by by taking into the average rate of injection of the 12.5 acre feet per day um, that is taking into kind of real world conditions that we've experienced in the past. So that would be our effort of bringing in what has happened in the past and saying, this is the infrastructure in the ground. This is our experience operating the last four years when the full project's been in the ground. We can't control the hydrology, but then if we look at the hydrology over um, the record that we have, and, and we pick the 50th percentile, which is the normal, um, the normal operational days, um, we would expect to average um, the 1225 acre feet. Um, and then with infrastructure increases um, that are already on the books, we would expect to average um, five to six acre feet more than that, putting us at 20 acre feet. Then the paragraph right below that, it talks about the recent um, extension of time that um, we worked through with um, this committee and the board to um, file for time to build out even more infrastructure that would allow us to jump from the 20 to 29 acre feet a day, which would be an additional couple set of wells in the valley. Um, and at that point in time, you would have the 29 acre feet per day. The 29 acre feet per day is what has built this massive mound of blue, um, but it, it would be built up, but not as tall at 20 acre feet a day moving forward with the infrastructure planned right now. So it would just, it would be nine acre feet a day less. So whatever percent that was, you can kind of in your mind, make that mountain go down that much. <laughs> Well, I think it ought to be down that much because it reflects the, the current reality, isn't, isn't it? Because you're not at 29 now and you don't expect to be at 29. We don't going forward, and and we have done we have done this uh, at what would it be if you harvested ten acre feet a day? What would it be if you harvested fifteen? What would it be if you harvested twenty, and then twenty five, and then twenty nine? So we do know what these mounds look like at those different rates. Would it uh, benefit us to have to show it all on the map, you know, like a red line that showed at 29 and, you know, so that we could see the various scenarios all in the same uh, sort of map? Wrong, wrong way on mute. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I, th I, th I think yes, because what it shows me is that even with the parallel pipeline and a more reduced rate, if you do have some wet years in climate, you do you do give your give yourself a chance in this transition. But it is, as Dave said, you know, the the worst case scenario is the start and drought scenario, and so, um, but but th that is available to um, to bring forward. I have another couple questions on Thank just you very much. Uh, 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 related to here. You say that Calam has asked for another, uh, uh, drill another lower valley well. Um, is, is this for ASR only? No, it, it's to enhance the capacity of the lower valley well field and to build firm capacity of the lower valley well field. But it is um, in testimony tied to increasing instantaneous volume. Um, lots of times the demand that um, the lower valley well fields um, uh, 
will meet. Um, they don't all need to be running all at once, but during ASR, they all need to be running all at once in order to harvest the most water. So it's to increase that instantaneous winter um, daily uh, extraction out of the valley. So um, yes and no. Well, yes, okay. That, oh, yes, I get it, I get it for ASR. Um, does it have any uh, effect on uh, when the CDO is removed and we're down to 3376 um, authorized? Uh, does this additional, was it additional well or an, a, a larger well? I mean, I'm, I'm not. It, oh, it's it's, it, it's an well. additional well in, um, in the old Rancho Cañada golf course area. And so th there were originally, um, uh, four large drought wells, uh, and and um, one of them, uh, after some usage, was determined to be under the influence of surface water due to water chemistry, and so specific rule sets were set on that well that the river had to be dry up and down a certain amount of days for a certain length of the river in order to know that that water was actually producing groundwater and not surface water. And so this would be in a way to replace the capacity lost by, by what happened with that well. Okay. And then what's a frequent treatment process? That's a- Sure. That's a frequent, um, I'm not familiar with. So, so the, a full rehab is pulling um, all of the pump motor, column pipe, and then introducing chemicals and swabbing and, um, and mechanically swabbing. And it, it takes, it's more expensive and takes more timing, but there, there's been a program, um, all of the wells were, um, were, went through a rehab in Lower Valley Wells in 2016. And that was um, also our best year of um, ASR uh, because we had the strongest sources in the valley. So um, instead of going through and um, rehabbing these wells on a five-year process, um, it was envisioned that um, going through and treating them with a less um, intensive treatment with an acid treatment, um, some types of agitation instead of um, a, uh, a full rehab would keep these wells from declining in performance at the rate where they would require rehabs as frequently as they, as they did. So there was kind of a more, instead of a rotating rehab program, it was set up as a rotating preventative maintenance program. Okay, um, can, uh, are there other questions? I have a suggestion on where do we, where do we go next on this? Let me go there. Um, I'm suggesting that we um, have a further discussion on this, but I wanna ask uh, maybe John, but uh, Dave, if Mary's suggestion about taking the um, 12 and the nine and the 29 or the 20 or whatever, whatever the variety of numbers are and put them into a common chart so we can kind of see the effects of, well, if the, well, the odds are this or the odds are that, or this is the average and this is the capacity. I mean, just so we have a distinction, a little different about what the lines may represent. Um, Cause I, I don't think this chart really communicated all that maybe you wanted to communicate. And I was having a hard time with uh, trying to imagine what the percentage reductions and, <laughs> and things were as we were going along here. Is that, is that possible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. A any other comments from the uh, committee on trying to get a handle on this? I feel good about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I think it'd be. Yeah, pretty much is varying the um, assumed injection rate is, yeah. is what we're talking about. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think is you know the, uh, the the technical side of this um, is a little beyond me, but I'm I'm kind of in Mary's camp about well I know the difference between thirteen and twelve and twenty and twenty nine. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you can help help me through that. Yeah, I'll be a lot better. I'll feel a lot better. <laughs> yep. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, and I just want to reiterate that we're we're going to start mixing a lot of um, long-term concepts with short-term angst because we're 
in a position now where we have a dry year, we've not broken ground on a permanent replacement water supply. And so, you know, Chris Cook and his team are gonna be scrambling over the next couple of years to make sure that supplies are sufficient for current demands. Yet, you know, what we're looking at here is, well, what's the long-term mm -hmm. availability? So, you know, we're just, we're gonna have to pay attention to our conversations a little bit from time to time that we're not mixing short-term and long-term concepts in the same desired uh, framework. No, I, I appreciate that, Dave. And I, I do think we need to spend a little more time on the short-term angst so we know what we're dealing with. Yeah, agreed. Really good advice. Um, all right, let's go to item number, the listed is number two, um, which is yep. uh, pure water. Protective yeah, and I'll, levels, I'm sorry, protective well levels. Well, yeah, and that's probably my area. I think that the proper term is protective water levels. Um, but I know it, it's been thrown out there as protective well levels as well. Um, so conceptually, and again, it's in, in the staff note, but conceptually, there's been some discussion recently about trying to get more water into the seaside basin than just replacing the existing overdraft or the annual pumping from the standard and alternate producers. And the concept is to, if you could get, you know, 800 acre feet a year near the coast or 850 uh, in coastal wells or a thousand acre feet further up the hill in inland wells, then you could provide greater protection for the, the water that exists uh, in the, the seaside basin. The reason this came up recently is um, in November, or I guess it was in August, uh, prior to the November Coastal Commission hearing, uh, the chair of the water master sent a letter saying that only the desal plant can provide sufficient uh, protective water levels or water for protective water levels. And that was a bit of a surprise to us because we, the district and Monterey One Water have planned uh, pure water Monterey expansion, assuming the same 700 acre feet a year of in lieu recharge that the desal project was looking at, but never was either project ever sized for protective water levels. So surplus water. So um, in some respects, <laughs> You know, we view that as confirmation that the desal plant was uh, a little bit bigger than everyone originally intended to size it up. If suddenly there's a surplus where you can have a thousand acre feet a year. Um, but we also realized that Pure Water Monterey expansion has excess capacity for a number of years. And so we just took a look at that relative to the you know, third party growth forecast and demonstrate that there is almost 100% sufficient water for protective water levels from pure water Monterey expansion. So to say that only D cell has the water to provide is, uh, is incorrect. Now, that being said, no one, and when I say no one, I mean the water master has not pulled together a plan to say mm -hmm. where would injection take place, what additional infrastructure, meaning pipes, pumps, and so forth, would be necessary, what identified source of revenue could purchase this water, who would purchase this water. So this item, item two, it was designed more to show you that there's a surplus available from Pure Water Monterey expansion that can very likely meet protective water levels, but it is not a plan. In other words, um, you know, we would need to rely quite a bit more on the water master to develop a plan, funding source, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think when you look at the math, it's kind of interesting. The one thing that um, I included in here is that if you wanted to put away a, a drought reserve using the excess from Pure Water Monterey expansion, so you just build up a five-year ASR drought reserve, at 6,500 acre feet, 
um, then you would peel off the first four years of pure water Monterey expansion capacity. But then the 30 years after that still yields over 800 acre feet per year on average of excess. So, you know, I think it's very uh, positive and optimistic that there, there will be sufficient surplus water for a number of years, if not decades, that if someone could afford to pay for it and had the infrastructure in place could do a lot of good. Um, and then keep in mind that the Inlu recharge program is a 25 year program, which means beginning in the year 26, another 700 acre feet becomes available to the Seaside Basin. So there are some avenues that could be pursued in the Seaside Basin um, where you know, additional or surplus water could be made available. And that's, that's really the whole point of this short staff note. Um, I think there's a lot in here. I want to I want to go to um, the 2250. Well, I want I want to I want to comment about the timing and the and the, the near term angst and you know if, if, <laughs> I want to roll a couple of <laughs> things together here. Um, but uh, if a pure water Monterey expansion gets approved, and this is just kind of to remind me of what I think I've heard um, uh, at other meetings. If it's approved uh, and you've already concluded that there's no bypass pipeline in, in the current, I mean, you know, all that's on the come, all that's to be, to be you know, dealt with later. Um, but if it gets approved, uh, it's my understanding that CalAM could start constructing the bypass pipeline uh, on a different track than the develop the full development of the capacity of pure water expansion. And so I'm, I'm just trying to confirm, can there be two uh, construction tracks in place if pure water Monterey is approved? Yes. Well, I gotta say, and Calam agrees to buy the water because that's gonna finance it. Yes, yes. And in fact, it's a similar case would be the um, pipeline that went up, or not General Jamar, um, Lower Ragsdale uh, last year, you know that that was an approved pipeline as part of another EIR for which the major project has still not gotten all of its project approvals. Well, I I, I want to tie I want to tie the two together because just because you prove a capacity of twenty two fifty for the extension, um, and and my understanding that the purchase, the water purchase agreement is necessary in order to provide the financing for that project, that expansion. Um, it, and that, that would have to go to the PUC, wouldn't it, if there was that agreement? Yes, yes. Um, and not to steer too far afield, but we've actually examined five different scenarios that would allow the Pure Water Monterey expansion to go forward. So it would secure financing. But there are um, philosophical reasons why some of those may not be on the horizon. And, and I guess just to be oversimplification uh, 101, if if the water master had the money and wanted protective water levels and was willing to buy all the excess that California American did not want to purchase for the next decade, you could do it. Um, if the district wanted to make an investment in drought reserve and put water in the ground, you could do it. Um, so you're not exclusively bound by a water purchase agreement, but that's really the direction you need to go. And, you know, when you, when you pay for the diesel plant in rates, you're paying hundred percent of the fixed charges, whether you use the full capacity or not. So a similar model with the water purchase agreement for pure water expansion would be, you cover the full cost of building the project and you take as much water as you want at any particular time. And if there's an excess, then the district could buy it, put it in the ground. The company could buy it, put it in the ground. 
Watermaster could buy it, put it in the ground. You know, there's some different permutations, but um, I think at the end of the day, your model, the, the, you know, a water purchase agreement to sell for potable supply is the best way to go. And just so uh, my train of thought isn't, is, I mean, I, I have kind of a train of thought here. If there are these options that are going forward, uh, fundamentally, it needs to be constructed. That's the first, that's the first decision. The second decision is how much do you buy of the water that's available? I mean, and then, and then of course, who buys it? And then what's the purpose for buying it? And then Calam's uh, in the picture for delivering uh, potable water to its, um, uh, its service population. The city, city of Seaside may or may not have an interest in this. Uh, the water master should have an interest in this, and I don't know if they've taken it seriously yet. I mean, I, I, I know they have. They no 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 serious plans yet. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to um, how to have this kind of discussion. Well, maybe it's too maybe it's premature to have this discussion until after we get some uh, positive uh, decisions for pure water expansion. I, do, I, get, yeah. I get ahead of myself. Uh, so just in the protective water level and just to the extent that, that I don't understand or uh, maybe you do understand, um, the water master, uh, I think in your note, you say that Calam has said they have no responsibility for um, meeting uh, protected well level uh, obligations or uh, plans. Well, yeah, that was a statement made in 2013. You know, their philosophy could change. And there's no, just to complete the loop on the thought, there's no obligation from anybody to cover the, the, the uh, actions that happened before adjudication, which caused the well level, caused the water level to uh, decline. There, there's no obligation to cover prior history to the adjudication, prior actions. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, yes, Karen. Um, question for Dave. Uh, when you say the water master could buy the water, the, the excess water, um, can you explain how that would work? Uh, would, would the water master be buying it on behalf of uh, the various um, takers, uh, water rights holders? Yeah, so that's that's actually where our analysis started to break down, which is, and it goes a little bit to what Director Riley was saying as well. If it's a problem that needs to be solved, then the natural first step is to say, well, who's responsible for the problem? And then not uh, blame is not the right word, but responsibility is then allocated by your proportionate share of causing the problem. And, you know, the options right now are, well, uh, do you go to Calam ratepayers? That's a challenge. Uh, Monterey One Water doesn't have any potable water supply history, so really not in on it. But the alternate producers, the standard producers, you know, City of Seaside was mentioned. You know, if if you're taking on, you know, the, the temptation is to say, let's not look back. This is a look forward, and the best thing for the basin would be to put additional water in it over and above everyone's right to take out. Um, but I think we, the district, kind of have a little bit of a hiccup over. Um, while, while we have indicated that our financial structure is such that we could probably raise rates and charges for protection of a groundwater basin, that doesn't mean that we necessarily should or have thought through who, who the responsible payers really are. And so I wouldn't want to just saddle, you know, one set of payers if we haven't completely defined the problem that we're solving and, and who should be on the hook for it. I'd like to point out that anything the water master would do would eventually have to go to the court for authorization 
to, yeah. to, to undertake. And the court's going to have ask that same question, who is responsible? And the water master is just going to be a pass through. And for the court to do that, there has to be some responsibility for uh, to correct a, a, an error, not just uh, that it's a good thing, good idea to do, because otherwise the water master is not going to, the court's not going to be authorizing the water master to do just what is a good idea. There has to be responsibility and yeah. remediation of that. Well, and I think the authority that's given to the water master is to make plans, not necessarily to implement anything. And I don't, I, I think they're a little, little slow there on that. Well, um, I, I like what, uh, what the data is suggesting is that the water, well, assuming uh, pure water expansion gets approved, there is, uh, there is a water source uh, that's available and it's a lot cheaper than any desal water for sure. Uh, but I mean, as, as a comparison, uh, but still until there's a buyer for the water or who can find the public interest or the public uh, accountability for a, B, or C in that formula, uh, until you can find a, a, a find a public purpose for it, then I think we're just at the discussion stages. Yes. The angst stage, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you summarize it Mr. accurately. Riley, you do have a question or a comment from your uh, uh, director, Paul? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, I, 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 I'd be very interested in exploring these scenarios Dave, Dave mentioned. Uh, Five. Uh, I mean, any any reasonable scenarios that might work to um, for financing buying the excess water, using it um, in in a you know, I, I would really like to explore that more. And maybe maybe that could be in another meeting of this committee initially, and then maybe mm -hmm. the board. You know that I think it's it's it's. It may just be in the discussion stage now, but if if there really are possible ways to um, to support the financing of of uh, the expansion, it would be good to it be it would be very useful to take take a look at that even now even um, go as far as we can at this point but to know what alternatives there are to Cal-Am entering into a water purchase agreement would be very helpful. Could we, uh, could we like have more information on, the, on these, the most promising scenarios, maybe at another water supply committee meeting? Yeah, I think so. I think that would be good. Do, do are we maybe two meetings away or do you think you can still have something sooner? Um, well, I have them, they've been, you know, they've been specced out. We had a couple of scenarios that involved uh, discussions with Monterey One Water and their general manager has left and I don't think they've yet named the replacement. So I'm not sure, I'm not, and I don't mean Monterey One Water, I mean Marina Coast about Water. about to choke, what? Yeah, yeah <laughs> Marina Coast Water District. Um, and there was one very interesting scenario where they don't need the water today, but they would pay for putting some in the ground to get priority to it later. And so it's kind of a time value of money uh, play. And so, yeah, we can, we can discuss it. I'm still trying to sort through Director Riley's um, other replenishment uh, topic items that we want to get on the agenda for next month. But uh, I think we should at least have a conversation. I really like that thought as well. Forgive me for jumping in, George, but because I, I look at some of the other areas beyond our, our um, just the district I, that are going to be in a position of really requiring some, uh, are going to be requiring water. And I look at the, like the Corral de Sierra areas and some of the other areas of the Monterey Subbasin and thinking that, you know, we need to, I think I have a personal desire to see a regional approach, a more regional approach than um, just looking at the, um, through the lens of just the district only. And my hope is that as we look to the future, we're able to expand 
um, the discussion points at any rate out so that we really can look at regional solutions. I think that the, the, the wider that we can throw that cast that net, keeping it realistic, I think the, the, um, the more options that we have for success, for long-term success. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I yeah I like that too. Well, Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of put it in your hands to kind of what you think you can handle and what you think the data requirements may be for reporting to us and so on. But you you clearly hear that we're interested in um, mm -hmm. trying to move the discussions forward. We we may not have answers yet, but at least uh, getting the understandings uh, as much understanding as we can, and and so sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. Um, just so I can report to the committee briefly, but I have asked the water master, I've asked Bob Jakes actually, when then, and, and John Lear, you should pay attention to, but <laughs> I've asked if there's, if there's a TAC meeting anytime soon, I would like to attend and discuss some of the mathematical formulas, I think, on, on how they share, how they say they share the expense in the replenishment fund. I, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to go down a track that's problematic or creating problems. Um, but I, and I'll try to stay looped in with John and David here if I can to not, not start a fire, <laughs> not start a rebellion. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I'm. Uh, it was on. It was on the agenda of the water master the last time, and I've just asked that 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 I have a chance to discuss it with the technical advisory committee uh, on, on some some of the mathematical stuff. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. We're on. Um, and I, and if there's any member of the public, by the way, that would like to comment as we go along, or please just raise your hand because you know the rules, and and, uh, and then we won't just take the time to ask each time. Uh, so item number three is uh, the seaside well and seaside seawater intrusion question. Yeah, and I'll, I think I'll let John cover this one. Um, I did enjoy editing his staff note for the good news, bad news section of it. <laughs> like um, but uh, John, if you want to summarize, that'd be great. <laughs> Sure. As a, as a component of the Seaside uh, Water Master, there is a monitoring and maintenance plan that has been established and that has chosen a number of wells to monitor. Um, and then in 2008, there was a seawater intrusion um, response plan that sets up a number of thresholds uh, to which you watch for. Um, and you, we have a number of technical parameters that we put these data sets through at the end of each year and then we um, either make a conclusion that we're not seeing seawater or we are. Um, in the last couple years we have started to see um, what in other basins say Pajaro Valley or, um, or Salinas Valley and I do see that Tamara is on the call here so if at any time you want to to share um, that would that would be great. Um, that we um, we started to see increases in chloride, uh, which is one of the prime in one in the shallow groundwater um, well, Fordor 09 and in Fordor 010, but more strikingly in Fordor 09, which is closer to the coast. Um, we were watching that, sampling it. Um, you see water intrusion happens at the rate it happens. So you, we were spacing our um, samples out quarterly and seeing um, it, in, uh, it increase. And we had said, as staff note says, four samples have increased above the pre previous samples. Um, one of the first things you do when you start to see higher uh, chlorides as you resample, you make sure that um, there is not a laboratory error or a, a collection error in the water. And we did verify that we were getting repeatable samples. However, um, we wanted to make sure now you need to test the integrity of your well to make sure that the well is not um, broken in any way that would be giving you a signal um, that would be starting to show seawater intrusion. But in fact, what we think we found is that um, we, we um, pulled all of the sampling equipment out of the well. And then um, a uh, hydrogeologic consultant, Martin Feeney, was hired by the water master 
to run a conductivity probe to see if um, if we were in fact gaining um, representative samples of what would be the aquifer um, screened interval at the interval that we were um, watching for seawater intrusion. However, we found something that was surprising that at 185 feet below grade, we saw a very big, we saw a relatively high spike in conductivity and it remained high all the way down the, the well. Um, the well is not screened at that um, 185 interval and we were supposed to be pulling in water um, down in the 600 to 700 range in the aquifer system. Now it's been known for decades that there's been seawater intrusion in the shallow dune sands and one of the mechanisms postulated for seeing the high um, chloride in in this zone that we thought was the Passeroblis um, was that there was somehow had found a um, groundwater flow mechanism to flow from the intruded zone um, in the dune sands, uh, Roma sands, down to the Passeroblis. Um, but um, in, in finding this, you know, we, we only can sample in the wells we can sample and we only have eyes on the monitoring spots we have that this well is not giving a signal that shows um, that we're seeing a slow increase in chlorides within the sampling zones of this well. Uh, likely the chloride in this is coming down from the 185 foot zone and um, is uh, getting into uh, going down and getting into um, the sampling of the well. So then it was my, my colloquial terms to Dave was good news, no seawater intrusion as this is not a, a reliable signal that we can um, indu induce the, um, the seawater intrusion plan on and we need to go back to the drawing board and try to find other pathways forward as we investigate this. So that was not the, um, the sound the bell um, uh, event when we went out there and looked at that. But um, one of the outcomes is this is since this is a two inch monitor well that may be cracked um, and may may not, we will have to work with the health department to see if we can um, if we can fix this well in a way that is uh, um, that is uh, acceptable to them. Um, we're going to video the well to see if it can be cracked, if it's cracked, if it can be fixed. Um, there may be some, there, there are some um, uh, rules that they have about the size of an inner annulus of a well, which we'd have to work around, see if we could get um, some um, possible variances to that. Um, we'll know more after the video, um, however, we also need to balance this against if um, anything we install in the well, if we were permitted with the variance, would allow for a sampling pump to advance past it. So the idea of this well is to have not only water levels, but water quality levels. So it may be a likely outcome that this well is no longer useful for collecting water quality. Um, it is used for the, for the um, monitoring and maintenance seawater intrusion monitoring plan. And it is envisioned to be used by the groundwater sustainability plan that the Marina Coast is, is currently putting together. So there, there is, well, there will be an interest in replacing this monitoring pump, this monitor, I'm sorry, this monitoring well. Um, the district did, does own the well and did install the well in the 1990s, it was done when there was an effort to explore, uh, when when we district was first allowed to go onto army lands and drill in in the northern coastal sub area and um, figure out the the hydrogeology of that area, but there is a priority um, replacement list that the district has that um, for these wells um, as they age because they're they're obviously with the failing of this one nearing their the edge of their age, and it's always sad to lose a monitoring point, and so. Um, it, it would be replaced and it would be thinking of, you know, what type of cost share the district would be interested in approaching and, and who would, um, if any, I don't know, that's, I guess, where we're looking for direction from the group and um, here are some of kind of the cost breakdown of some of the possible outcomes. Um, the, um, the question of, um destroying the well, rehabbing the well, maybe repairing the well somehow, is that a legitimate option? Um, repairing the well would be, um, if, the well, if the well were found to be cracked at a joint, um, it's at 180 feet, you could 
attempt to slide a smaller casing into that that would go down past that point, maybe 200, 250 feet into the well. And then you would have to demonstrate that you were not, that you had stopped the seepage of that water. Um, uh, that would be a question for the um, health department if you wanted to do that. This well is going to be a well that's going to generate a lot of important data for um, for um, either the water master's monitoring and maintenance maintenance plan or the groundwater sustainability plan. And so that would be also balancing, are you saving something that is going to be compromised yet again in the future that's trying to generate important data sets? So that was something else I had cautioned Dave about that didn't make it into the staff note. Well, then the other question would be to replace the well. And that's what you're talking about now, potentially replacing the well. Yes. And, and I would think that the location of that well would, I mean, there would be opinions about where that location ought to be. It wouldn't just be nearby necessarily because Marina Coast may have an opinion, uh, Watermaster may have an opinion, uh, you may have an opinion. Is that fair? I think so. I think that the, um, the, the thing that I failed to mention is that, you know, they're, they're co-located with each other um, in, in the same bore. So they're what's called a nested monitoring well. Um, we also need to determine that the deep well is not compromised, which we're going to do at that time. It does not seem to be. Um, and we would, um, if, if, if we were to move to destruction, we would destroy that uh, shallow, keep the deep. So there still would be a deep well in that location. And then it would, the, the conversation would be around where can you permit to put a well that would generate a data set that 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 could hopefully be hooked in some way back to the data set that that, that these wells had generated the, the history of sampling these wells um uh, the the Fort Ord wells prior to the establishment of the water master were not sampled or sampled all that frequency maybe a couple times every year there were other wells that were um, the Monterey Sand Company and the PCA wells that the district used uh, for seawater intrusion and this is primarily because the um the, the deeper strata in the four door nine wells and four door 10 wells more resembles the strata that you find in the Salinas Valley. And when you get to the, the most Southern Sentinel well, which has not been there before the establishment of the water master, but you move South along the Bay, you get to the mon the other two monitor wells that are the coastal wells um, that were used for seawater intrusion monitoring by the district. And those are where you find the, the occurrence of the the Santa Margarita sandstone. So north, uh, when you pass from the monitoring well sets to Fort Ord 9, you, you move into strata that represents the Salinas Basin and not as much the um, seaside groundwater basin. So that was kind of the reasoning why the Fort Ord 9 was not sampled at a high frequency prior to the water master. Well, this is, uh, the, the, the good news is, is, more, is gooder than the bad news, in, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Sounds that way. So is there a time frame that we're looking at with this, John? <laughs> well, we'll want to, yes, we're going to authorize um, as soon as possible, getting Martin out to get the video and learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, th then the next step would be to um, decide if the well was salvage salvageable or not and if it was even permitted to be permittable to be salvageable and then to make a decision on you know th then it would be um uh, letting the health department know what we found and what we what we plan on doing to remedy it and then um and then completing that work and then moving forward um uh, in whatever capacity we're instructed to work with the other stakeholders so I would I would think the first couple steps would go much quicker than the than the than the last step if it went to well replacement. Thank you. Okay, no, this this is very interesting. It's I mean the good news is really good news. I mean, assuming it can be confirmed by what you're going to do next with the yeah. testing process. Yeah, I think I think what I was the, what I was trying to say is that um, the trend that we were seeing in this well that we were um, saying 
this could possibly be seawater intrusion um, is not a trend you can trust as giving you a reliable trend of seawater intrusion. So it's not, it's not a um, definitive data point on the track to seawater intrusion. We, we, we weren't there um, as the group, as the TAC. We wanted to see Martin's, um, Martin's uh, uh, there, there are other other signs of evidence like the induction log and the, which I haven't gone into here multiple signs of evidence that pointed toward this but um, myself Martin um, uh, 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 hydrogeologist from Todd groundwater we've all kind of looked at this and and say yeah this this is this it was really if this was seawater intrusion it was going to be a strange case that wasn't as textbook as Pajaro Valley and Salinas Valley Great. yeah. And with the uh, with all of this, are you planning to engage the the water master TAC in this just you know in a collaborative uh, effort or? Yeah, not? this will this will be on the next one next item, and and I don't know if it's appropriate if if Tamara, I know you're on here, you're on the TAC with me, and I know that you're probably here to hear this. I I'd like to hear your thoughts and maybe have you share them with our water supply committee. Tamara's connected to who? A county water resources agency. Oh she yeah. Good. She she, run, she runs the um, um, seawater intrusion network for the county in Salinas Valley. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, Tamara, you you tell us. Yes, hello, uh, Tamara Blanc, associate hydrologist with the Monterey County Water Resources Agency. Um, can you all hear me fine? I, I sometimes have difficulty with my speaker. Yes. Yeah. Nope. Good. Great. Great. Um, yeah. So so uh, this was definitely a head scratcher of an issue when we were first looking at it. Um, to see these slow rising numbers in, in FO9 and, and perhaps in FO10 as well. Um, and yeah, last month uh, TAC meeting, we really kind of got into it and wanted to um, really get into the data before pulling the trigger on the, um, on the uh, uh, seawater intrusion response plan, which would, um, as you imagine, trigger a great deal of things as well as um, some, some not small expense. Um, and so this is really encouraging to, to see Martin's initial, um, you know, thoughts on this work and to hear John's as well. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have any, uh, any trouble with what John has explained to the group here as far as what it looks like is occurring in FO9 uh, with uh, a, a crack or a leak at a, at a higher level in that water, you know, seeping in. And because of its density, then dropping and descending in the casing, which is why the water quality would start changing at that 180, 185 foot, and then continue down um, at that higher uh, conductivity level. Um, and, and John has really well explained the, the issues involved with the attempt to rehab and then still have that well be a valuable data point. And so that I think for the TAC and for the other entities in the area, of interest for seawater intrusion monitoring is going to be hopefully something they'll think about hard um, in, in the expense to rehab a well that may or may not give us really good reliable data in the future or the, the, or the expense of, of um, you know, drilling a different pair or, or a, you know, a well to pair up with that one. A question, Tamara, and after sure. and either one. Um, does this need to be confirmed by other tests uh, still to be conducted? I, I other can, than yeah. the, Go for it, Tamara. Well, yeah, I would, I would say chemically, I think we're looking pretty good. This all makes sense um, in what the data is, you know, what the data we have, this is a good explanation for what we're seeing in the chemistry data. Um, you know, what, John has identified as further next steps with videoing and looking at the case at the at the crack if you can find a crack and how big it is and where it's located and could it be patched rehabbed well um, reliably um, uh, you know that would certainly be something I'd be interested in seeing but as far as is there additional my background is chemistry uh, not geology as strongly um, and so you know for me chemically this this is a, a, a a, a valid explanation for what we're seeing. And, and thanks, Tam. And I would tag onto that is that um, I was trying not to d dive too deep, but we did an induction log, which is a log that measures the conductivity of the sediments and the water in the sediments. So it's a, it's a 
measure of conductivity or resistivity. And the zone that we thought we were starting to see um, increases in chloride, which would have indicated um, seawater intrusion, did not show an, indecrease, an increase in the um, induction log since the, the point of drilling. So if you would have had uh, a saline water moving through the aquifer down and into the screens of the well and being recovered by the sample pump, you would have seen a decrease in um, and, or an increase in conductivity in that zone, which we did not see. So those two lines of evidence are very strong that the saline water is, is as, as Tam said, um, in, introducing itself into the um, uh, well bore and then being more dense and floating down. Well, this is, um, I would say good news is the better, the, the, is the better news is the good news. The, the, the biggest news is the good news. <laughs> If there's some repairs that have to take place and some and, uh, rehabs or replacements or whatever, that's to be discussed and to be financed and to be budgeted and to be what acted on somehow. Um, so is there anything more on this particular topic? No, stay okay. tuned. I, I, wanna, I wanna thank Bye. Tamara for contributions and John too, for sure. I do have just one last question and I don't know if this is what Dave, you had referenced just earlier in this uh, discussion. But is Marina Coast Water included in the discussions that we're having about this particular well? I know they had indicated an interest in the area. Yeah, not as of yet. Okay. Yeah, we, we have just um, brought this is this is uh, you know within the last um, we we barely got it into the agenda in time. So. Oh, great! Good, yay! Cutting news, cutting edge, <laughs> leading edge. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Thank you too, so much, Tamara, as well. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay, uh, let's uh, go to uh, item number five, uh, federal legislation. Yeah, and this is uh, also kind of a, you know, hurry up and wait kind of thing. But I'm going to start at the bottom of the staff note, uh, because it, the level of complexity gets deeper as we go up. So as part of the, you know, there were really two acts that got passed. One was uh, the Appropriations Act in late December, and then the American Rescue Plan that um, just got approved. Both of them have pockets of money that can be used in the water and wastewater area. But despite John Garamendi's efforts to include special districts in the federal legislation, uh, he was not successful. And so when you look at the, you know, the last sentence here, the 350 billion, this is nationwide for state and local governments, uh, 130 plus billion went to cities and counties. That's a 65.1 each, um, the rest being state. And so you may have seen some email chatter going around with the California Special Districts uh, Association or CSDA trying to get members to support an initiative whereby 5% uh, of the pocket of money that would go to the state would be uh, segregated for use by special districts. So that's where CSDA is spending its time right now um, and then trying to get other special districts to uh, you know, provide letters of support. So that would be the, the state's own general usage pool of money. Um, otherwise, you know, every special district would be begging their city or their county for some special attention. And you know, our view is that the local cities especially, but counties pretty much uh, in lockstep have so many needs as a result of COVID that they're not going, their jurisdictions aren't willingly going to give away a piece of their pie for special districts. The American Rescue Plan also has 25 billion for emergency rental assistance. So that's money that doesn't really find its way into the utilities hands, but the renters can use that money to also pay uh, delinquent uh, utility bills. So that'll have some impact uh, in helping out with the higher rate of uncollectibles that uh, many uh, utilities are seeing. But the rest of the money and the biggest portion of the money is emergency funding for low-income households. And 
while um, you know we've heard that the other funds, those general funds that the cities and counties have access to can be used for water and wastewater. Most of the way we're structured here in California is that those would be special districts. And so it's gonna be challenging to do so. But the special districts could end up on the delivery end of the low income assistance. It's unclear. Um, this new, this new uh, program for water assistance so it's the low income uh, household water assistance program is gonna be modeled on the same type of program for energy assistance that is administered through the California Department of Community Services and Development or CSD. But they also rely on uh, other action agencies such as United Way and others. Um, Many utilities already have their low income ratepayer assistance programs, so they've got data um, and they know who qualifies. But I can tell you that the federal Office of Community Services has to uh, bless this program and then implement it. And so that will take time to roll out. That money's there until September of 2023, so they have a, a, a window. But trying to get that money into the hands either of the utility to distribute or other action agencies. Um, we won't really know what this is gonna look like for you know, another month or two, I, I suspect. But I just wanna put it out there because everybody thinks it's a you know, big feeding frenzy that there's this trough full of money that's available and um, it's gonna be more challenging to both get and apply to water or wastewater infrastructure um, it's going to go more for economic relief of uh, the low income families or, you know, a city department that has water or wastewater could employ some of this for infrastructure, but it's not like you're going to see Monterey One Water get a big chunk to go revitalize its uh, system or, or us or even Cal-Am for that matter for just infrastructure purposes. So it was just included informationally. There, there's more info if you'd like it. I can get you uh, federal write-ups and so forth. But uh, that's really all I have to offer. Just a quick comment is I, I know Senators Feinstein and Padilla have also come uh, out in support of the special districts uh, getting the funding from the state. Yeah. Well, that's good news. Because I was going to ask, have we joined with the Special District Association to join their campaign? Uh, yeah, we gave them authorization to use our name on uh, the signature page because we had at Legislative Advocacy Committee previously addressed the two or three attempts they made to include special districts in the legislation. So it's consistent with that, that approval. That's good. And that's good news, Mary, what you just reported. That's good to hear. Um, so will there be, uh, there'll be updates as we go along on this issue? Yeah, yeah. You know, the federal government pushes it down to the states. The states are going to push it into the various local uh, hands, and we'll just have to see what's, you know, accessible, if anything. Okay, final item is update on Pure Water Monterey. We can go very quickly on this. Uh, Maureen broke the drilling rig, and so, <laughs> no, she didn't, but the, con the contractor... Uh, does have a broken drilling rig. So work on deep injection wells three and four has uh, taken a pause. They're trying to get parts. Um, that being said, we did 313 acre feet of injection in March, which is a very good clip. That's, a, that's probably our best month ever. And so the, the operations uh, are going quite smoothly in general. Um, but as I said, DIW three and four uh, are taking a little pause. Maureen, I don't know if you want to unmute and add anything in there. Um, just some good news. I apologize. I should have let you know late Friday, they did get the rig up and working and drilled through Easter weekend oh, good. Um, night and day to try to catch up. I apologize. I should have, have let you know that today. No, that's fine. We also had... Uh, <clears throat> one of our consultants on Thursday 
which not coincidentally was April 1st, <laughs> started, started the morning, started the morning with a, a text to Paul Shudo and myself saying that there was a, uh, a part that there, we're going to be unable to get for uh, a pump and that both inject, deep injection wells would be delayed to first water sometime in the middle of 2022. What? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't immediately respond. I kind of thought about it while I was in the shower and said, well, what's this going to do to our uh, water purchase agreement <laughs> items of default? And thankfully, by the time I had uh, gone back to the text stream and, and Paul's beginning to get very concerned about what to do, it was admitted to be a uh, April Fool's joke. You know, you have to really love your consultants to let them get away with that. But then I talked to Maureen like 45 minutes later and she said, well, do you want me to stop work now or try to get more work out of them before I have to stop work? I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, uh, Monterey One Water didn't get their uh, contract amendment. We're not going to be able to continue in deep injection well number three. And I said, she goes, you haven't heard that yet? And I said, well, who'd you hear it from? the consultant. I said, well, you better check back with the consultant because he's having a little bit of April Fool's fun and games this morning. So that was the last <laughs> time I talked to Maureen on any of this. But um, yeah, it's um, so that is good news. And it was on April 2nd. So we know that it's legitimate good news. So thanks, Maureen. <laughs> well, it's just like the weekly in closing uh, Highway 1, Big Sur. <laughs> yeah. in, in one minute, in one minute, three lines that I knew it was an April Fool story. I knew it was, but you would not have believed the comments that were circulating around the county. People were outraged, you know, <laughs> this is hilarious. Didn't you get it? <laughs> you gotta pay attention to April. Really? Somebody said, I was getting calls from friends in Central Valley in San Francisco and I nearly texted back, but I didn't. You have friends? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's it. So we, we are moving along pretty well with Pure Water Monterey. I, I can tell you we've moved from weekly uh, operations updates to bi-weekly because things are going uh, just that smoothly at this point. People wanted some time back. And so uh, we have an every other week standing call at this point. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. yeah it's a good, good project. So we, so we do have uh, the last item is suggested items for uh, future agendas. I'm, I'm going to ask Dave first if you see anything coming that requires action as opposed to getting informed. Well, I, I think we need to pay close attention to what happens with the Fort Ordwell yeah. uh, monitoring mm -hmm. well, so that if, I mean, as of right now, this was just informational, but if um, two parties make a decision quickly that, um, well, that they know that we're going to ultimately probably have to destroy the well. Um, John will have to check that with the county public health, but um, yeah, it, the cost sharing will have to come back to, to action. Um, but that that could be a couple meetings away. Um, you gave you know you gave us some work on financing Pure Water Monterey expansion, at least to uh, discuss, and then the uh, other water master replenishment assessments and calculation of the replenishment rate and those things that you've asked for separately. So I think we've got the start of an agenda, but um, any other items, I'll take them. Um, I would only add what I saw in the weekly about the cities and the uh, little parklets uh, uh, and the water, uh, the water authorized for them. Yep, that will actually be on the board's agenda uh, because we need to extend the emergency ordinance. Mm. And we now have three cities that have gotten very aggressive about extending their parklets. Um, I think Stephanie Locke has been in communication with the city of Carmel's ad hoc committee. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a concern of ours as well because um, we never intended this to be permanent and even the extension of the emergency ordinance is not intended to be permanent. Um, it, but that'll get talked about at the full board meeting. Okay, that's good. Um, any other uh, thoughts or suggestions from the committee? Um, one, one other, um, I know that the infrastructure bill ha hasn't been written yet, but um, are we following 
is someone talking to Jimmy Panetta to see if there some of the uh, funds in the eventual infrastructure bill could be for recycling and that sort of yep. Well, yeah, we did. So yeah, yeah. So the Title sixteen program monies um, have been looked at, and that's where we've had most of our success. When I say our, I mean you know Monterey One Water and ourselves together. Dave, um, yeah, we're Dave, we're watching an item for future discussion. It's not yeah. on the agenda. Yeah, I'm just saying we're watching it. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Hey, well, if, uh, I think that's all the business we have. Uh, I want to thank the committee and thank John and thank uh, Tamara and uh, thank Joel and thank Maureen and thank everybody. <laughs> Go Gonzaga. Thank you too. Yeah, it's up pretty soon. It'll be starting, I think, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Good all right. Bye. This meeting is adjourned. Bye bye, thank everybody. Thank bye. you so bye. much. Bye.